Kringle by Tony Abbott Prologue and Chapter 1 About mystery of the boy, his early years, and how he came to be what he became, I suppose everyone everywhere has heard nearly every kind of story. Such mistruths and makings up, such fantasies. Only a few remain who were with him from the start, and fewer still who could tell you the tale properly. So many lies, and for so many years. Finally, there was nothing left to do but take up the pen myself, which I had little expected to do at my age, and set down the facts from the very beginning. That the boy had a beginning, and that I was there for most of it, is all you need to know right now. So gather around, light the lamp, settle yourselves into a comfortable place, pity those who come in late, for once the story starts, it doesn't slow down much. You might say it hasn't slowed down even now. You might say it's still happening. But never mind, there's time enough before we get to that. For now, shh, let me begin. Chapter 1 The Sparrow Deep in the land of ghosts and frost, back in the days of long ago, in the time before and a little time to the left of the time we know now, when goblins roamed the earth and rough tribes of men battled for this or that frozen inch of frozen earth, we might, if we turned our heads just so, peek through the eaves of a low roofed hut farther north than you or I would care to go, and see inside it a small boy crouched before a cold hearth. Tell me again, he said, his breath forming and fading in the frosty air. Merwen bent over the hearth. Yes, Merwen, that was the old woman's name. She would never let me forget her part in this story. She came from a place called Weary All. That seems fitting. Merwen of Weary All. She cracked some twigs and tossed them into the hearth. Tell you what, then, she said. There was a little growl. There was a little growl of annoyance in her voice. And why not? It was night. Her fire was slow to light. Food was running short. The hut was freezing. Worst yet, the weather was turning more bitter by the half minute, and the little hutch thatched roof... Loose and cracked, let it all in. Wind and ice and snow and everything. Tell me about the bird, he said. Ah, <sighs> the old woman heaved a sigh. She loved the boy, of course she did. But how many times could she tell that tale over? Time and time again, for what, ten winters? Not counting the two or so years before he could speak enough to ask for the story. Why had she ever told it to him in the first place? Well then, well then, she breathed out another long sigh and cast another long look into the hearth. She poked the logs around with a big stick she kept just for that purpose. One or two small flames started in the kindling and crawled up the logs like fingers, hesitant, wanting to escape. Merwin, he said, the bird. Yes, yes. She sank onto a low stool and turned to the boy. His long brown hair dangled on both sides of a pale little face. He was keeping his eyes on her, wasn't he? Those big brown eyes. He was small for his age, poor boy, and thin. But bright. Far brighter than me, she thought. Just look at his face. There's a twinkle in it. His mother told me he would do things. Great things, she said. The gods alone know what that means. But the boy does think about everything, doesn't he? wonder about everything, say everything, ask everything. He always asks for this story on cold winter nights, so it must be winter again. The boy's eyes were fixed on hers. Why is she fussing so very long with her hands, he wondered, and why does she keep poking the fire with that stick and looking at me and not saying anything? Do I have to ask again? Merwin, fine, fine, 
But before the bird, she said finally, before any bird at all, there was the storm, you know. A big storm with lots of ice, said the boy, eager to get her talking. He did love the beginning of the story. You said it was the worst storm. It was, it was. For days and nights it came down, rain to begin, then snow, then ice pelting from the sky. The world was frozen through. The great wheel of the year had wound down to nothing. The days were short and the nights longer and slower than ever before. It was midnight on the third day and the storm was raging still, the center of it getting closer, closer, when over it all you could hear the sound of a young woman crying. My mother, he said. Oh, she moaned. Oh, oh, it was such a sound. It had gone on for hours and now it was midnight and storming, and right in the middle of it all, you cry out. You, boy, your ha little howling voice added to your mother's. And all of a sudden, there you were, in my hands and in the world. She paused, the whole weight of her nodding slightly on the stool. The boy lowered his eyes, then raised them to her again. They glowed like pools of dark water in the firelight. I was born in a storm. Mind, she went on, the goblins were out there too. Filthy green creatures, faces like mud, ears like cabbage. I knew that well enough. They were out there. This was the goblin long night, after all. The longest night and very end of the year. The night goblins like best. And this was no ordinary storm, for goblins make storms. We know that now. But we had never heard of that terrible wand back then, or how the goblins conjure wind and snow with it. And this storm, roaring for days, had wrapped around the village and all the houses nearby. Your good father was lost to a goblin not three days before, and here they were again. She stopped talking so suddenly that he knew she was listening. Listening. He'd seen her do it every time she got to the middle of the story and mentioned the goblins. Listening was something she did often, stopping whatever she was doing, turning her head and closing her eyes. He listened now, too, above the crackle of the fire. He didn't breathe. He couldn't. He knew about the terrible black-eyed creatures. He knew about their storms. He knew they had killed his father. Was that a sound? Was it? He had often thought their little house was too far away from everything else. It lay nearly hidden among the trees and rocks of a sharp drop called the Bottoms on the lower edge of the Black Woods, 800,000 acres of the densest, most forbidding forest in the whole North Country. From the Bottoms, the nearest town of Castrum was a full day's hard walk. No, no, it's nothing, she said. There was no sound now except for the low wind wail and whistle in the eaves and the near soundless fall of snow on snow. Everything else, if there was anything else, was silent. Nothing stirred. Good enough. Good. The poor woman takes you in her arms your tiny self wailing like a stolen child, and she smiles with love for you. And it comes, said the boy. It comes. Out of the wind it comes. A sparrow, a sparrow, I tell you. Lost? Gone mad? Frightened by the goblins? Who knows? It was and is a mystery, but a sparrow it was, flying in the dead of night. Right through the open eaves and into the room, it came in a sweep of snow, shivering and shaking, and then is gone again. Gone! The poor thing wasn't warm an instant, but lost again. Poor Sparrow! She stopped, turned her face to the fire, and gave another long sigh. The boy frowned, but before it went, before it went, she cried, leaping into her story again, the tip of that sparrow's wing struck a bell hanging over the fire. I hear it still. Two little notes, more said than rung, more sung than said. In that moment, over the winds raging, your mother said, Oh, how I never will forget it. That's his name. 
That sound is his name. And she spoke the word to me. The boy stood now, his mouth open and his eyes wide and wet. The sparrow was gone in an instant. She sighed, exhausted by her own excitement. What became of it in the wide world I cannot tell. Your mother, poor soul, was gone then too. With one single breath, whew, like that. They heard the bells too, of course, the goblins did. Don't ask me if it was him, their terrible king. I don't know. But whoever was out there heard the bell ringing out your name, and they came, and I wrapped you in a cloak, and we fret, fled from place to place until here we are, the two of us, you and me, alone together these twelve years. She finally drifted off to silence, as she had done every time before. A minute or two passed, with neither of them speaking. Then, as he had done every time before, the boy crossed the room to a wooden box that lay on a shelf by the window. He took it down, set it on the table, opened it, carefully removed a red cloth, and unwrapped a tiny bell. He shook it. Kringle! And that's the end of chapter one. I'll see you back again for chapter two.